All right, we are live. Thanks for joining us for our Arts and Veterans mm -hmm. panel today. Uh, I'm Tammy Minershaken. I'm the chair of the Frisco Arts Foundation, and our goal is to champion the arts through advocacy, education, and grant making. You know, there is a lot going on in the world right now, even as we speak. Um, so it's vitally important that we find ways to bring us together. Uh, and so we'll be talking about two things that do just that, passion for our country and love of the arts. Uh, and our guests today have um, those two, um, they're undeniable. So I'm really looking forward to the, the discussion. Before we get started though, I wanna let you know that you can be part of the conversation if you uh, just add your questions in the comments. We have a volunteer, Kalika, who's sitting behind the camera um, and she's gonna let us know when there's a question that comes through. So uh, we definitely want it to be a joint conversation. Uh, and I also wanna say thank you to Annette Weiskup with Insperity for hosting us in this beautiful place here. Um, we're at Frisco Station. Uh, and Anthony Barocas is our live stream producer. Um, if you need any live stream uh, for your organization or your business, go to stream for us, stream for dot us um, with Anthony and he'll help you out. Everything has to be virtual now, so um, it's a good, a good person to know. So, um, all right, well, let's get started with our amazing group. Um, if you're first, you know, joining us for the first time um, on Frisco Arts and this arts panel and you're wondering what is this and what are we doing today, uh, Frisco Arts has been hosting panels uh, for the last couple years, actually, to talk about the intersection of arts and other sectors. So we had um, an arts and health, arts and business, arts and tourism. Before January, uh, actually in January, before COVID hit, we uh, discussed arts and sports. So we already had the arts and veterans uh, topic in the books um, and then COVID hit. So we don't have anyone in the audience today, uh, but I know you're watching online. So thank you for joining us. And this is gonna be recorded and put on our YouTube page so you can also share it with others. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that we kept this one um, in, our, in our calendar because one of our previous board members used to say that um, every day is actually Veterans Day. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that sentiment. I know for me as a Korean American, um, you know, second generation, there's no way I would be here um, living in America uh, and enjoying my freedom without the brave men and women that are in uniform, you know, securing our freedom and all of you. So, um, so it's, it's an exciting time for us to be talking about this even right now in our, in our nation's history. So I wanna introduce our guests to you. Um, around, the, around the room here, we have Peter Burns. Uh, Peter is the uh, program director of Frisco's Young Entrepreneurs Academy, a board member of the Frisco Chamber of Commerce, the Frisco Education Foundation, Frisco Public Art, and Junior Achievement of Dallas. He also serves on the Leadership Frisco Advisory Council and is chairman of the Mindbender Academy. He received a Congressional Veteran Commendation, was 2019 Distinguished Veteran of the Year, uh, Frisco Style Magazine's Person of the Year in 2014, um, was also named the Frisco Chamber Citizen of the Year, and was also runner-up for the Dallas Cowboys Community Quarterback Award. So he's like local celebrity. <laughs> so thanks, Peter, for being here. Rob Altman, he is currently serving as the chair of the Frisco Mayor Jeff Cheney's Veterans Advisory Committee. Rob's a graduate of the George H.W. Bush School of Government and Public Service and is an Art of War Scholar at the U.S. Army's Command and General Staff College. Rob is a member of the American Legion Peter J. Corsi Post 178, the Frisco Veterans of War, Foreign Wars Post 8273, and Texas Society of the Sons of the American Revolution. So thank you, Rob, for being here. He's also a really great vocalist, so maybe you'll <laughs> sing for us today. We'll see. <laughs> Uh, Sheena Lawless. Sheena is the first female commander elected to the Frisco VFW Post 8273 since its inception in 1968. She also serves on the Frisco Mayor Jeff Cheney's Veteran Advisory Committee and is an active member of the Women's Veterans of America. She worked as a paralegal with the U.S. Army Judge Advocate General Corps, assisting military judges and lawyers with legal matters and judicial work all over the world, including Seoul, South Korea, and Tikrit, Iraq. So thank you, Sheena, for being here. And Bryce Hansen, he is currently the Managing Director of m and at Wentworth Management Services. He graduated from West Point, worked in the U.S. Census Bureau, and served in the U.S. Army Special Forces as a Green Beret in Iraq and Afghanistan. Upon returning to the States, um, he has begun painting and is a self-taught artist. You can see some of his work uh, behind us. 
He's a creative humanitarian, a diplomat warrior, and he's comfortable with the ambiguous. I stole that from our conversation. <laughs> so um, first of all, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you for your service to our country. Um, why don't we go around the room and uh, just start a little bit with how, where you're originally from and how you ended up in the Frisco and North Texas area. So Peter, we'll start with you. Well, thank you, Tammy. Thanks for the opportunity to be part of this discussion. I was born in Jamaica, in Kingston, Jamaica. And uh, my family and I, we moved from Jamaica to New York City in, when I was 12 years old, August 6, no, August 8, 1972. Now I'm trying to remember the dates. <laughs> right. And I uh, grew up, so I did, went through middle school and high school in New York City and then um, joined the military. And I, and I, I wish I could tell you that I had um, a, 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 a year in it to join the military. It wasn't, it was, my, it was the recruiter that kept calling my house and my mom said, <laughs> Just go see what she wants so she can stop calling. And, uh, and so she showed me videos of what soldiers do and all that. And what got me excited about it was driving a tank because I wanted to just run over a tree or something. You know, I, I just saw the excitement of it. And um, she said to me, where would you get a job driving a tank once you get out of the Army? And that was the first uh, real time that I had to make a decision. And I had scored very well in the technology area, so that's where she steered me towards. And I went into that uh, that field, learning how to you know uh, install telephones and switchboards. And, and I was the operator. I was the person on the other end that says, "Operator, may I help you?" You know, <laughs> making corrections. And uh, so I got into engineering and architect design and, and everything else throughout my uh, career from there. And so when I retired from the army, I uh, moved to Texas. And which I was stationed here at Fort Hood a couple of times. So I always wanted to come back here. My wife wanted to come back to Texas. And so we moved back to Texas and started our second career here um, in, in the Frisco area. So I'm excited to, to be part of this community mm -hmm. and to uh, be able to contribute to the community as well as what we contributed to our services. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. How about you, Rob? <clears throat> so I was born in. Brunswick, Georgia. My father at the time was stationed at what is now Glencoe. He was an enlisted man in the United States Navy. I had a grandfather who served as an officer in the Coast Guard and another uncle who had served as an officer in the Air Force and was a pilot in Vietnam. So service in our family in the military was uh, generational, if you will. So <clears throat> I grew up Mostly in southeastern states. So my wife Shelley, who is a uh, who is an original Texan, uh, likes to call me a Southern mutt. But uh, <laughs> so we joke. I I was when I came into the family, I very quickly realized that I had to say I wasn't born here, but I got here as quick as I could. Yeah. <laughs> I had to go down to Texas A&M University to get my citizenship as a Texan. <laughs> uh, and so uh, right. after. After serving enlisted in the Army, uh, and, and I didn't have somebody telling me to do something technical when I joined, mm -hmm. I, I had dreams of jumping out of airplanes and that sort of a thing. So I served as an enlisted man in the 82nd Airborne Division and then later on realized that I should probably finish my education as I started to yeah. get a little older and, and realized that might help me down the line. I did go back, finish my undergrad at A&M in history. So as we talk about art, mm -hmm. you'll see how history has influenced my uh, perception of the world. I later went back to A&M in the George H.W. Bush uh, School and studied international relations as an officer. It was a great program that the Army sent a lot of us to get our graduate education. Very, very fortunate for that. Um, we, we always knew we would settle in North Texas, but I, I thank and, and credit my wife for choosing Frisco. I was at a point in my time with the Army as a major and a battalion executive officer where I had no awareness other than my battalion and my soldiers. Right. <laughs> and so Shelly was my hero and she did all the research on where we needed to move the family. And mm -hmm. so um, part of it being familial because her mother lives in Plano yeah, okay. and uh, we wanted to be close and then she did research on Frisco and we are one of many who come here for the uh, school district. So Frisco ISD drew us to Frisco. And the first event that I attended in Frisco was the, uh, one of the first events was a Frisco veteran social. And I had met uh, JD Lawless and uh, Sheena's husband at a recruiting event at Fort Hood. 
and he wow. corroborated what Shelly had already been telling me about Frisco was wonderful. And then I went and saw the Community Day Parade mm -hmm. a, a couple of years ago, and I thought, this is right out of a movie. This is where I need to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so yeah. for many different reasons, Frisco was a place we fell in love with. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Is that Community Parade, is that canceled this year? It is, right? Oh, so sad. Well, we're, we're celebrating here. That's right. <laughs> Yes. Sheena, how about you? Um, I, I'm originally from this area, actually. Oh, okay. um, my husband retired after 20 years. I also did five years active duty. Um, in 2008, um, he was working on his second career, and I said, well, let's go home. So um, he's originally from Arkansas. Um, my mom was very thankful I married a southern boy. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, we just settled back here, and uh, this is where, you know, this has always been home for me, but mm -hmm. now it's even uh, more of a home because of the veteran community that I'm involved in. Um, a little bit about my service, um, you already kind of said everything with the JAG Corps, um, got to do all that, that was pretty cool. The reason why I joined the military is um, I graduated high school very young, um, a lot younger than most people do. Um, I was 16 when I graduated from high school. And, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure on kids to have everything kind of figured out. And at 16, I had no idea uh, really what I wanted to do. Um, so I joined the Army. I also come from, um, you know, I have people in my family that have served. And so um, it was something that I, that I just kind of did, but it ended up really being a blessing um, just because it, it really kind of shaped me and, and it opened doors and showed me passions that I didn't even realize that I kind of had. Um, I just kind of gravitated towards the legal world. I'm still in the legal world. Um, uh, business transactions and regulatory, um, sh in short form, I work on contracts at, uh, with FedEx. And um, that's just one of the things that I like to do on the side. Most people think I'm the commander of the VFW <laughs> full-time, yeah. which it is a full-time job, but that's not, uh, I also have a professional career as well. Right, right. Um, and I really enjoy the veteran community uh, just because it's really opened friendships and networking and uh, really opened your eyes and made you aware of all the amazing benefits um, that being in a community like Frisco um, it's just beneficial yeah. for everybody. Now we're so glad you're here. Thank you. And Bryce. How yeah, are you? so I, my story is very similar and has elements of what everybody said already. Um, had a very similar conversation with a recruiter yeah. that my, my mom used to work at the high school I attended. She came home. She's like, I met the nicest young man <laughs> and I invited him over to come talk to you. Oh, Little yeah. did she know that, that she had already uh, uh, set the trap. Um, so he came over and, you know, what do you want to do in life? And I had zero clue because what 17-year-old mm -hmm. does? Um, and he's like, you know, we had videos and everything. And I'm like, wow, you get to shoot guns? Because <laughs> my dad won't let me have a gun. Yeah. He's like, what kind of gun do you want? You want a machine gun? Yes. <laughs> he's like, you want a tank? Yes. He's like, so I took all the tests yeah. and I, I want to do the same thing. I want to be infantry. I want to be, you know, like I want to be in the like where it's like really aggressive and uh, testosterone filled. And he's like, mm, yeah, how about mechanic? So I was like, I don't know anything about that. And he goes, uh-uh, combat mechanic. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, yeah. <laughs> I have no idea what that is, but I got super excited about it. <laughs> you know? So, so yeah. yeah, I mean, if that doesn't explain to you the naivete of uh, a 17 year old uh, filled with hormones, then um, nothing else will. Um, but early on, I quickly realized I was not cut out to be a mechanic. And um, I think my leaders identified that as well. What I did have a, a, a hankering for was leading other people mm -hmm. to do my projects. <laughs> um, and, yeah, I was like, I don't know how to change out an engine block, but I can convince all these other people to. <laughs> um, and so I had a first sergeant, um, he said, you know, what's, what's your horrible? as a soldier, you know? Really strong, because you get in trouble a lot, so. Um, they ended up sending me to West Point, and um, I was a horrible cadet as well. Asked too many questions, why, why? That's not good in the military. Um, and then, so, but uh, I grew up all over the Midwest, and then uh, once I graduated West Point, I just did about 14 years overseas, and then, um, 
between Korea, Germany, Iraq, and Afghanistan, of course. Um, and then uh, spent, after getting out of the military, I lived overseas in the Middle East in Dubai with my family for about five years, working for their government, doing some change management consultancy in their Department of Defense. And then um, very much uh, like your wife, we, my wife and I sat down and we just started looking at where do we want to live in the United States? We want to raise our kids back home. Um, and we just started very systematically looking at different cities across the country and um, no family ties, you know, like some of you guys have to the area. We just looked at the schools. We looked at the economic opportunities to leave that, the military and the contracting government space and where could we reinvent ourselves. And there's just, I mean, this, this Frisco is kind of like the little um, American dream. Whatever you want to do, it's here and you can achieve it and you can reinvent. I'm a walking example of somebody who went from being a Green Beret and being a contractor for five years and then coming with no network, no family, and just picking Frisco on a map and saying, we're gonna move there because there's opportunity and that's where we can, we can uh, maximize our, our potential, so. That's awesome, yeah. No, there is no city like it, truly. It's a, yeah, it's phenomenal. Um, so let's transition a little bit into the idea of art. And um, I really believe that, you know, storytelling is really the heart of all art, all art forms, um, visual art, music, dance. It's about human connection, human expression, um, and really just, you know, the way that we relate to each other. So I think, you know, with storytelling um, and with all of you, there's, there's a lot of people out watching today that know you in the community, they, but they haven't heard some of your stories about what makes you you, and especially during your service. So one of the best ways I think that we can honor our veterans is to actually share those and, you know, speak them aloud. So, um, so I wanna ask each of you, um, you know, during your time in service, what would you say, and I'm sure this is a tough one because there's so many, but what would you say was one of the most challenging experiences you had um, that made an impact on you and, and why? I can see wheels turning. <laughs> Who wants to go? Rob? <laughs> so I was very fortunate to serve in many different units and but there's one experience that was very formidable for me. It was both tough emotionally, and then it was also very rewarding. Uh, probably more so from a strategic and a personal growth level, but it was when I was serving uh, south of Tikrit in a place called Samara. And sitting, for those that are watching that don't know, Samara, Iraq is where one of the third holiest sites in Islam is at. And in 2006, Al-Qaeda blew up this mosque. And we had as an army already, I want to say it was either two or three times, uh, executed what we called clear, hold, and build uh, strategy in that area. But I was very fortunate that when, we, when my unit went there, uh, one, the leadership, the people were amazing. Uh, from a cultural standpoint. I am a big believer that culture will set a tone either positively or negatively. Mm -hmm. And fortunately for us, we had a very positive culture. And it was the short, it was best explained this way. Kill those that, uh, and, and I'm sorry, that's raw, but uh, kill those that need to be killed and help those that need to be helped. I guess the politically correct way would say it would be eliminate the threat and help the people that need to be helped. Mm -hmm. But from a soldier's standpoint, you can understand that. And, but it set the tone for honor. Uh, it set the tone for self-preservation. And it was just, in a, in a harsh environment, it was very positive. Mm. And what I loved about that experience is that while we lost people, that, you know, that, that, that hurts, and I still think of them and think about their families and, and look to see how those children are doing, and I wonder how those mothers and dads are doing, that you cannot have lived through that and not have experienced that. And we can talk about that a little bit later, but um, uh, that experience was so positive because on the front side of that deployment, there was the, what we call kinetic element, which means fighting element. But on the back side, I was able, because of my leaders, to see, uh, you know, let's just say nation building, because that's familiar in the narrative, mm -hmm. actually played out in a positive fashion. 
I, I saw bad things that didn't happen that could have happened with respect to policing. And it all went to dignity and respect. Mm. So I was somebody that was foreign to Iraq. I was not an Iraqi, but there I was in their country. And so, and I, I know Bryce understands this because as a special forces uh, soldier, that's understanding the culture that they are in is something that they're trained to do and they know second. I was just very fortunate to have leaders in this unit who had a lot of special operations capability, who knew that we needed to learn the language, learn the people, find out what was important to them. Not so much, you know, anyway, I digress. But mm -hmm. that experience was both because it was both hard mm -hmm. and it also showed me a model of positive in, in the midst of a, a tough situation. And um, wow. since then, I, I just, I leave that knowing that um, in time and space, things will change in Iraq. But I know that we impacted people in Samara and in, in the uh, Sunni Triangle for good at that mm -hmm. point in time, mm -hmm. and and that makes me sleep very well at night. Right, right. Wow. Yeah, and, and as Rob was talking, a couple of things came to mind in that same mindset, and that is, you know, I told you about the people that were in my life to help me to make good decisions. But later on, when I was on a deployment, you know, our mindset—you're so locked in on the mission, right? You you know what you're going to do. There's no distractions because. When you're responsible for soldiers, you're responsible for taking them to the battlefield and you're responsible for bringing them back home. You don't ever want to lose anyone there, so you're, you're just simply locked in. And I remember um, in a, uh, one of the deployments we were on, and I was in the restroom washing my hand and um, a local um, a lady was in there cleaning at the time and it was snowing in the middle of May. And I, and I said, wow, I can't believe it's snowing in the middle of May. And she said to me, everything has been messed up ever since the war. And I was shocked that she spoke English. But what it gave me was an opportunity to just listen to her story. Mm -hmm. And she told me that all the males that in her family, her brother, cousins, husband, were all missing, mm. wow. right? And it put in perspective the reason why we were there. Now, uh, in all our previous deployments, it was always, you know, it was, you were going on combat exercises where you're eliminating the threat, helping those that need help. But this time we were going in a peacekeeping operation, right, um, in, in Bosnia. And so there wasn't, the threat was there, but it was, you, know, you were going in there to be part of the solution to help them uh, recover, no more to stop the war, but then help them to recover. And uh, listening to her story put it all in perspective as to the reason why we were going there, right? We take for granted here all the things that we have uh, for freedom. We know we, we, if we want to start business and fail, we, we have the, you know, we have the privilege to do that, right? But there, in in their country, if they weren't, um, you know, following the government, then the whoever was in control would would um, eliminate them, mm -hmm. right? The, the the people that was responsible for them. And so, uh, when we had the opportunity to go in to prevent that from happening, and then to hear someone that we were impacting, right? You know, it really put things in perspective as to why you're serving and why you're there. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, mine's a, a little different, and, and this might be a little off track, but, um, you know, when I joined the Army, uh, there were bets against me as to how long I would last. I was just trying to be better than Goldie <laughs> Hawn, Private <laughs> Benjamin, okay? I mean, we can talk about, you know, amazing Green Berets and Special Forces. <laughs> that was not me. Um, I... There were people, she won't last a week, 30 days, and then, you know what? After I got in there and I got my feet wet and I figured it out, oh, oh okay, I can do this. Mm -hmm. um, it was almost like a challenge to me at that point. Like I had something to prove. Mm -hmm. Like I had, not necessarily like they were discouraging, like, oh, she can't do it, but that she can't do it, like hack it kind of thing. So, um, you know, don't get me wrong, my family was very supportive, but you know, they, they did secretly in the back of their minds say she'll be back home very soon. <laughs> um, so like I said, just trying to be better than Goldie Hawn, private ranch. So, um, but what's really cool about it is, and I didn't see the impact then as I do now, because mm -hmm. um, at the time I had no idea. Um, you know, like a lot of people refer to people like me um, that maybe had an administrative position in the JAG Corps as you know an admin or a paper pusher or you know not the ones that really go to war and um, that is so far from the truth at this point because 
I mean, I'm sitting here going, okay, yeah, that's my job, and you know, I can do my job well. Everybody has a job, right? And that's how the army functions, or that's how the military functions. And then I quickly find myself, um, okay, well, I'm no longer behind the desk. Now I'm sitting in a Humvee with all these people riding down in a convoy, going, okay, I can be, you know, you know, right in the middle of all of this, just like the other person is. And so. What is really impactful today um, that I like to share is just that preconceived notion where women in the military aren't necessarily that, um, that always that admin or always that, that person um, and that there's real combat situations that occur that doesn't care if you're a male or a female right. or it doesn't care really what your job is. <laughs> and so that's one of the things, uh, just the other day uh, somebody said, oh, well, you're a paper pusher, or you're admin or whatever. And I was like, well, I was like, that IED didn't really care when it blew up my truck that I'm a paper pusher. Yeah. And so she said, oh, and, it, and, and what's really cool about it too is I never really figured that I didn't have like a long military career, or, you know, I, I did what was asked of me and I, I feel like I did it well, but there was nothing I necessarily did that was leaps and bounds above anybody else. Um, but it's really cool to come home and be visible with my service mm -hmm. and what then encourages others to be more visible with their service because I'll be the first one to tell you when I first came back here and transitioning um, with my husband doing 20 years active duty and retiring, um, you know, I said, oh, well, you know, I only did five as opposed to his 20 or, you know, it's almost like I was apologizing for my service. And then finally somebody said, like, no, you did your time. You did what was asked of you and you did it well. And um, there's no, there's nothing to be sorry about. Mm -hmm. And later on, I realized after, you know, the VFW here in Frisco has grown substantially over the last few years and, you know, over 50% of our membership is now 50 years and younger and 22% of our members are, are female, I'm going, okay, so when we all start to be visible with our service, mm -hmm. um, it's just very encouraging um, yeah. to hear other people's stories and, and just to kind of be in the presence of this panel alone is a little overwhelming for someone like me, but then I just have to realize like, okay, it's not about me, it's about everybody else and being visible with their service and saying, hey, I'm here too. Mm -hmm. So that's what I really, really um, go back to the whole impact thing is like, okay, maybe I didn't really understand then, but I feel like I'm kind of understanding a little bit now. No, your representation is so important because, like you said, people see you and they think, oh, I could do that or I could yeah. be part of it. So, no. Or don't necessarily apologize that you're not special or, you know, you didn't do anything crazy or, you know, you right. didn't jump out of airplanes or hell fast rope down a, you know, out of a Black Hawk, but you know what? You still did your, your time. Right. And it takes all of us to, <laughs> exactly. you know, make sure that, you know, we continue to be the best country in the entire right, world. Right, all service is important. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, so I'm gonna echo some of the same things. So uh, I, one thing that I th think the military does really well and it's something that uh, Rob touched on is uh, mental tenacity, mm -hmm. you know, and adaptability to change to a, an, uh, an ever-changing situation. You know, the enemy gets to vote when you're in war, right? They don't care what, who's inside the vehicle, whether they're an admin, JAG, or, you know, the guy who's like at the tip of the spear, right? They're just going. So you always have to be able to adjust. So the military does a really good job of training that mental adaptability to go from offense, defense, and to immediately go into a stability operation or helping those that need to be helped after literally minutes after you just got done dealing with the people, the threat. Mm. Um, and so for me, the, the biggest challenge for me was is coming from a career of that, of just jumping through hoops and very ambiguous situations and trying to figure it out. Um, my biggest challenge was when I left the service was, you know, you spend your whole, every soldier in every country, I've been all over the world with different soldiers, they're all the same. Mm. No matter what country they're serving in, they all hate their job, they hate their boss, <laughs> and they think they could do it better. The food's never hot enough. It's never tasty. They're, you know, the, the sleep is horrible. The equipment is outdated. You know, it's like, even if it's not, soldiers love to complain, right? <laughs> even with all that mental tenacity, um, we love to complain. Um, so when I was getting ready to leave the military, 
I had all these complaints in my head about why I'm leaving. And then uh, when I was transitioning, uh, I quickly realized, yeah, that wasn't so bad. I kind of miss it. And so I know we're going to talk about camaraderie and the, the way people connect, whether it's through veteran organizations or through the arts. Um, but for me, that was the biggest challenge, mm. was yeah. not having connection anymore uh, with people that I could relate to. I mean, we don't know each other, but immediately as soon as we came in, it's like boom, boom, boom. Yeah. And it's like we've known, I've never met Peter before. Right? But immediately there's that connection, that camaraderie, uh, and there's that yearning for connection. I know you see it at the VFW. Mm-hmm. Um, but being over myself, being overseas for so many years um, and transitioning, and there wasn't any of that stuff. So it's just, right. for me, I had to channel all of my, what am I going to connect to? And then that's how I ended up getting into the arts was mm-hmm. what am I connecting to? And so I started painting my past. Well, that's so. perfect transition because I wanted You're to welcome. talk about that. <laughs> Definitely wanted to talk about that. And then the concept of, you know, how art has the power to make invisible wounds visible because I have heard, you know, that veterans, you have actual physical wounds you can see, but then there are things that you cannot see. Um, that you're struggling with, like you said. Uh, so, so tell us a little bit about your journey into painting and then okay. one of these um, works that, that kind of exemplifies that. Okay, sure. Um, so I said I left the service in uh, 2012 and uh, immediate couple months here and there, but uh, basically moved to the United Arab Emirates uh, within a couple months. Um, and I was working with their military and helped it transform uh, where basically the U.S. military was in the late 90s mm-hmm. uh, into where we were, and they wanted to do that in about 18 months. Uh, so no small task. Um, but learning the culture, they had a certain thing where they didn't really want to work past 1.30, 2 o'clock. <laughs> and in, in our military, they're like, 1, 2 o'clock, you're just getting your day started. You know. Uh, I remember when I first came in the Army, one of the sayings was, is, we'll do more before 9 a.m. before then you'll do all day. Yeah. And uh, that saying bears out because when it's 9 p.m. and you're still going, you're like, oh, man, when does this day end? Um, so I quickly found myself coming home early. Um, and early. I'd be home by noon, 2 o'clock, and my wife's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. She's like, I didn't get married to you to spend all this time with you. Like, you need to get a hobby, go to school. You need to do something. But this is when I, we were married. The first five years we were married, I was gone over two and a half of those years. So 50-50 relationship. She always told me, as long as you get a job and you're home 50% of the time, we're good. Like, we'll be happy. And so now I was home all the time. She's like, this isn't working. Um, and so it... I had all this extra time on my hands. And so it, you know, what do you do with time? Mm-hmm. New place, no friends. You just start reflecting mm-hmm. on your experience that yeah, I just left months before. Um, and so I was an amateur photographer uh, when you know, I, just, I always had a camera on me. You know, I'd, went, with technology, we were talking that before this even started. It was like, we, talk, we were talking about Blu-ray and laser disc, but with cameras, it was a, the quest to get smaller and smaller. So everywhere I went in the military, I had a tiny digital camera. Um, and so I have tens of thousands of photo- photographs. And so then as I was, had time on my hands, I was actually starting to go through those things and process. Now I had the time to do it and I was removed from the situation. I had time to process mentally some of those images that I'd seen and then just sit and look at it and then get the smell. The feeling, the noise, the, the, just the whole atmospherics of everything that went on in that image and start to relive it. Um, and what I found is it was evoking um, some emotions that I didn't even know I had had at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so working through those emotions, um, and so I started picking uh, different pictures and I said, I wanna spend more time with that image. I wanna spend more time uh, with what was going on, maybe not in that particular image. Um, so like the dog is a good one. Like um, I, that one's titled, I, I Got Your Six. So whereas I, we were on a mission in uh, Afghanistan in an area that uh, coalition forces hadn't been in years because it was in a remote area. It was, the def- terrain was easily defendable from the, mili- uh, from the uh, enemy. And once we got there, you know, and they knew we were there, heavy machine gun fire immediately. You're like, they weren't RPGs, rockets. Like, they were not happy that after a couple of years of their little control that we decided to show up. 
Um, and so uh, once we had eliminated some of those threats, um, I had a chance and I'm just kind of like sitting back and I'm looking and uh, our dog handler, um, he and, uh, was just watching a little area, you know, taking a little pause in the break. And I just thought it was peculiar that the dog, who was an integral part of the team, nobody told him to do it, but he knew his part, right? So whether it's admin or everything, like everybody's got a part to play. And even the dog knew his part to play, which was, he's looking this way, I'm gonna watch his back. And so in the military, we have that okay. saying, I got your six, I got your back, you know, I'm there for you. Um, and so when I was transitioning, I realized how powerful that was because I was thinking, well, who's got my back? I live in a foreign country, I don't know anybody, so who's got my back? And I think that's really valuable what this is, what we're talking about, what you do with the VFW and everybody that's connected with uh, advisory boards and things. And that it, it all comes back to that camaraderie. And so there's the camaraderie between the dog and the handler, and then there's the camaraderie with the greater military community at large. So yeah. I think some of the, a lot of that stuff gets extrapolated from that image for me mm -hmm. um, because I spent so much time with it. And this piece over here, I mean, Tell us a little bit about what's in the background and what it represents. Yeah, so um, I, I had started painting a series of um, what I, just the GWAT or the Global War on Terrorism uh, series, um, which the, these two images uh, behind me are from. And then I wanted to, uh, I started connecting with some of the older guys here in the DFW area, um, and namely uh, guys from the Vietnam era. Um, so I would go down to, I didn't go to the VFW, I'm sorry. No, uh, that's okay. Your skill's very different. <laughs> uh, so I, I connected with uh, Green Beret uh, Association and some of the old timers, uh, the guys that would, you know, had jungle boots, but they had footprints on the barefoot footprints, and they were going cross-border operations that were completely off books. And he, lit, sitting and talking to these <coughs> stories, and I, think, and I was thinking to myself, I've really flushed out a lot of the stuff that's in my life, and now I'm hearing them, and I'm like, these guys are crazy. And they're here in my stores, and like, you're crazy, you know? Like, it's just, and I think that helps put context to, no matter what situation you're in, it gets back to that mental adaptability of whatever situation you're in, that's just normal for you, and your unit, and your brothers and sisters in arms. That's just normal. And so when you leave the service, back to my challenge of, Where's my camaraderie? Where do I fit in? And then you get this and like, I can immediately trust everybody here and I can lower my defenses. Mm -hmm. um, if there was a panel of people and it wasn't virtual, it, I wouldn't be as forthcoming because I'm like, well, I don't know those people. Mm -hmm. But I, and I don't know you guys, but I immediately feel trust, right? Because of that camaraderie. So I started talking to these guys and I wanted to spend time with and try to put a walk a mile in their shoes um, and start looking at the Vietnam uh, generation and looking at my transition, looking at their transition. Mm -hmm. um, so I started looking at some very iconic photos. And so um, I just started doing a deep dive and I had an idea to use comic books from the Vietnam era as a canvas. So in the background, I'm not that good of an artist. I can't paint all those images in the background. Um, that's all um, strips from the, the Nam, mm -hmm. which is a Marvel comic that I made a canvas out of, and then I painted an iconic image of a guy um, in, that I labeled the duality of man, right? So here he is, you know, in military green, but he's got the bandolier of M60 machine gun ammo over him because he's ready for that dealing with the threat, right? But then you look at his eyes and he's kind of like, what is his thought process? Mm. And the fact that he's wearing the piece, so he's, he's symbolizing I'm a killer, by trade, yeah. but my human nature says, I just want peace, I just want, mm -hmm. why can't we all just get along, mm -hmm. you know? So I think there's every soldier when they deploy or they're in uh, going from kinetic offense to defense to stability operations, dealing with the threat, helping those that need to help, and that, that mental transition, they're constantly saying, well, who am I in this situation? Am I a soldier? Am I leading with my weapon? Mm -hmm. Or am I leading with my heart? You know, am I being rational? Am I being emotional? Um, and so I think that the, it, the contrast or the juxtaposition of the bullets and the peace sign kind of rolls into the thought process of what's going on in his head behind those eyes. Yeah, wow. 
You know, it's really interesting to think about like the heart and the brawn, because that's really what service is. I mean, but you're all, because I'm not, I'm you know, not ever served. So to me, to hear you say that, it actually is um, really insightful because I had this perception that you have to be kind of all brawn, mm -hmm. you know, when you're in the army and you're, you know, doing your thing. Um, but it's, I mean, it, we're all human, mm -hmm. you know, and we all want to actually work on peace and get things to work together. And, uh, but you, sometimes you have to do the hard things to make that happen because there is evil in the world. Um, so thank you for sharing the stories behind um, both these yeah, sure. uh, pieces. And then Rob, I know you brought a piece as well um, that I think speaks to that too. Can you tell us a little bit about this one right here? So uh, real quick, I yeah. wanted to say that um, this panel is really relevant, I think. One of the things with Frisco and our veteran community that Sheena touched on that I love for everybody that's watching mm -hmm. that loves art is that 2020 has been, a, we were talking about this before, 2020 has been an interesting year. Mm -hmm. And so I love that we're talking about, you know, Rise is talking about tenacity and resilience. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I think as veterans that why we are so appropriately placed in the community right now is to share our experience of tough experiences mm -hmm. with others and say, hey, you can get through this. Yeah. You know, this is a tough time, but you can deal with tough situations and you can come out on the positive side of it. Yeah. I also wanted to say that, Sheena, you're more of the historical model than those of us that have served for a long time. Historically, here goes my history side. In, <laughs> in the history of America, we are citizen soldiers. Mm -hmm. And that's, that is a, a, since the 60s and the idea of a professional soldier, there's been a little, uh, not a negative friction point, but a friction point as we developed this idea of a professional soldier. But historically in America, we're citizen soldiers. You serve your time, and then you go home, as John Keating likes to say, you serve your country, now you go home and serve your community. Right. And so yeah. I think that's appropriate. Um, with respect to the Soldier's Cross, if you're catching up on cues around the room, some of us are sort of reverent with this. I'm a little more comfortable because it sits in my house. It sort of creeps Shelly out every <laughs> once in a while. But because she's like, ah, you got to get that out of my house. Bro. <laughs> but this is, uh, and I know she's watching, so she really didn't say that. And I know she, she loves that. We love you, Shelly. So you're, so, you're so in trouble when you get, oh yeah, I'm totally in trouble. So uh, this is, to the, to the Army Service member, this is a Soldier's Cross. Mm -hmm. To the... Uh, sailor, airman, marine, or coast guards, men and women, this is a battlefield cross. And it, it goes, in history, it goes beyond the, the, uh, the American service member, but it, it is essentially a, uh, is a way to honor those that we've lost. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the boots and the, and the weapon and the, the dog tags that are here. And uh, this specific bronze has, you can't see it from the camera, but it has the state of Texas engraved on the left side of the helmet and it, it states Texas. And this was made for me by a friend. Wow. Uh, well, actually, it was made by a friend of a friend. So I met a gentleman by the name of George Turek in Philadelphia. Uh, he's a Vietnam veteran. He was an E4, a specialist. Uh, he had served two years in Vietnam, was wounded, two Purple Hearts, a Bronze Star. Uh, he was over in the jungle running around uh, with the 1st Cavalry Division. And, uh, and he came home and, uh, you know, like many who serve and then come home, he was, what do I do now? And so he had loved art when he was growing up, spent a lot of time in some of the art museums uh, around Philadelphia and would just go look at the paintings. So he became a, an art collector. And, and some of his historical art pieces, you guys, are, are just amazing. He has some of the cast from Remington in his office. I mean, the, the, the Bronco, uh, the, the one that I think it's the, um, the Scout, uh, so he has three pieces, uh, they're just amazing. He has original pieces that you only see in the Smithsonian, that the, the sister or brother picture, um, the, you know, the Jefferson, the, the Washington, some of the, uh, some of the more famous pieces that are in the Smithsonian on the mall. Uh, so I love it when I go visit and stay with him and Michelle because <laughs> those pieces are gorgeous and mm -hmm. they always joke and say, yeah, Rob's going to go stay in the president's room because they're, they're, I think the artist's name was Sully, uh, if, if memory serves correct. So for those of you that are more educated with art, you'll know who to, who to Google. Um, but this bronze was made by a friend of George uh, and another Vietnam veteran named George Chernak or, um, and, or Andrew Chernak, excuse me, Andrew Chernak. And Andrew Chernak actually came up with 
several bronzes. He's done a lot of work for Gettysburg, uh, the, the battlefield. Uh, um, and he also did the bronze star, or I'm sorry, the gold star mother's plaque and gold star mother's bronze. And I don't remember exactly where that's located right now, but uh, Andrew is a phenomenal sculptor, and this was made, I'm, I'm pretty sure this one was made in the, the Philadelphia Iron Works. And last year, we were doing an Army Gala uh, to raise money for the Army Scholarship Foundation and the Museum of the mm -hmm. U.S. Army. And so George had uh, Andrew make this for us, and we brought it down to Texas. And uh, we, may, we may very well soon have this in, on display in Frisco somewhere to honor everybody that has served. Mm -hmm. And um, so it is both, uh, is both reverent, uh, but also uh, evident and, and makes one think about service. And I just love the sculpture, so. Yeah, yeah. It's actually amazing that it's a sculpture because it right. just looks like it's those actual pieces. Right, right, <laughs> right, 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 right. The detail is incredible. I know the camera can't see it, but I took some photos and we'll put them on, on Facebook. Um, so let's transition to the concept of art and community and service, like you were talking about. Um, you know, each of you are involved in some way um, with our community, uh, but especially with the veterans. Um, Sheena, do you want to tell us a little more about <laughs> VFW and yeah. um, your role and, and what you guys do? Absolutely. The VFW is Veterans of Foreign Wars. Um, we are the one of the longest standing nonprofits in the city of Frisco. We were mustered in 1968, uh, January 25th, 1968. 52 years we've been around. Um, the Frisco Garden Club has us beat, so um, they've been around <laughs> a little bit longer than that. Um, you know, to be a member of the uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars, you have to have served in a conflict, boots on ground, um, somewhere, um, whether it be you know World War II, Vietnam, Korea, um, Iraq, Afghanistan, Gulf War, Panama, I mean, you name it. Um, but what we do is just, you think of veterans like the initial hub. Um, you know, you have different nonprofits that folk are specialized in different things, you know, specifically mental health or something like that. We do it all. <laughs> so whether you're needing your uh, resume and a job transitioning, we have people that do that. Whether you're needing somebody to help you with put in your disability claims or get your education benefits, we do that. Um, we have a flag exchange program. There's businesses all around the city of Frisco and even outside that purchase flags for us that, um, you know, it funds our relief fund. Uh, we have the Walk of Honor out at the, mem the memorial um, where you can buy m bricks and leave a lasting commemorative piece in the ground and honor your service member or your business or, and, and that also funds our scholarships. Um, we focus on our youth. Our, you know, we understand our youth today are our future leaders of tomorrow. So, um, you know, 13 scholarships is a year, and we're increasing those gradually every year as we grow. Um, we love to invest in, in, in our youth. The, let's see, women veterans, we have a whole women veterans program. We're heavily involved with the Student Veterans of America. So if you're a college, um, like me, I went back to school when I came out of the military and finished my finished my bachelor's and my uh, further education. Um, so, you know, the Student Veterans of America, Scouts, um, were, Rob Altman actually, uh, while he wears his uh, Frisco Veteran Advisory hat and he's the chair of that board, he's also our scout leader um, within the um, VFW. He was last year and still continues on that role today. Um, what else? Am, oh, we have motorcycle group. The motorcycle group that goes around and they promote patriotism. And um, I don't know if you remember, uh, you've heard of the Patriot Guard and you've heard we go and honor our fallen um, just last week. Was it last week or the week before? Um, um, a, a sailor that was on the USS Oklahoma at Pearl Harbor um, was killed. His uh, remains were exhumed and he, the, he was identified and they laid him to rest finally um, in wow. Plano uh, a week and a half ago, Amazing. I think. Um, and so those are the, and I'm transitioning with the motorcycles because they come and they come in fierce when um, those type of, we want to honor their service. Right. Um, so how do they find you? Oh, so, so here's my thing. When I came um, to Frisco, like, you know, a lot of people you hear, they say, oh, we don't know any, like, 
there's no, nothing here for veterans. And sometimes when I hear that, I'm just like fall out of my chair and I'm like, oh, but there is. And um, <laughs> so, and, but let me tell you all about it kind of thing. And um, we, we're pretty heavily, we're getting better on social media these days. Um, and so you can find us on social media, Frisco VFW, um, but we are a website, friscovfw.org. Um, also, I didn't even touch on the biggest thing, unmet needs. Um, you know, a lot of problem, a lot of things that veterans have a problem with is asking for help or assistance. You know, when I first came back, you know, I, I'm I'm trying to get my career going. I'm I'm all of a sudden I'm pregnant with twins, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And so, um, you know, I really tried to do it on my own for a long time, and then I realized that it wasn't possible. And then immediately, when I find people like the ones that are in this room. Um, you just are able to collaborate, and I don't know how many jobs that we've been able just to get veterans these days, just because I'm like, what do you do? Oh, you're IT? Oh, I know somebody, let me, and we connect, and we do those kind of things. Um, it's just, That's wonderful. it's really, really awesome to be able to do that. Um, you know, just, we have a homeless women veteran that was sleeping in her car here at the racetrack in Frisco. Wow. We swooped her up and put her up in a hotel, got her a job, rewrote her resume, fixed her benefits, um, and we're still That's with amazing. her today. That's you know, wonderful. just last night, or not yeah, a couple nights ago, my quartermaster is knocking on a door delivering $200 worth of groceries because the family didn't have any food. Um, you know, those problems that we think about, um, they exist. They exist here, and um, while we don't just help veterans of foreign wars, we help all veterans and their families. Um, and the Frisco VFW is a little special and call me biased, but we tend to pick up the slack on our other area communities around us um, when they can't get the assistance or the help they need. Um, wow, that's amazing. So a lot of times you'll hear us say, uh, not to, we, we say Frisco because we obviously are biased, but you'll also hear us say North Texas. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. So we obviously shared this event with the North Texas veterans and we, is, is simply a, um, we just want positive patriotic action in the community. Mm -hmm. And I think that we are, as veterans, really greatly placed here at this time in our nation's history to say, hey, you can get through, like I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. this, but veterans will, we can help you. We can show you how, let's do this together. And then for future generations, as you mentioned earlier, is that positive patriotic action in our community is a really good thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Peter, you know, uh, so we have Bryce, who's the artist. You're on, on the public art board. Yeah. Um, I always thought that was so interesting, <laughs> um, that story, too, how <laughs> you got on the public art board. Uh, yeah. But tell us a little bit about that role. In so, what you're doing. I, I, before I go, I got to tell the story, though, um, <laughs> because, you know, in, in Frisco, you can't spell art without Tammy, right? Yeah. There's just right. no way, right? It doesn't and exist. It just sure. doesn't exist. So I'm in New York on vacation, taking some time off, and I get a text from Tammy says, hey, congratulations, you're gonna take my place in public art. <laughs> Whoa, what? You know, I fell out. I like, what, what are you talking about? No way, you know, and I'm thinking, there's no way, who did that, you know? And I remember I had applied for, to serve on one of the boards on the commission within the city, and um, the city council was, their wisdom to put me on the public art board. And I was thinking, art, I didn't, Apply, I didn't even submit an application for art. You know, what are you talking about? I can't follow Tammy. You know, I, mean, I had this big thought in my mind that I've got to do what she does, right? And I said, we need to meet. Let's just get back. And so I came back and we, uh, we set up and we, got, we had coffee together and she told me, she goes, no, let's go arts, public art board. I go, oh, okay. Put my heart back in my chest, <laughs> right? I said, oh, okay, I can do that. But why, why me, you know, and so, I had a, a meeting with the curator for the city, Becky Dio, and that was probably one of the, that was one of the greatest um, time, because it was almost like sitting down listening to your grandmother mm. talking to you about art, and uh, you know, and how to care for it and take care of it, right? Just prepare me to serve on the board. Mm -hmm. That was the best. So when you were talking earlier, and we, you know, part of our leadership training was to go back and review some of the, the battles in the past, right? And so we would go and walk the battlefield and learn from it, right? Here's what the commanders had, and here's the decisions that they had to make. You know, you, you just, you kind of learn from it. So it was history mm -hmm. of that. 
And I think that's what art does too, right? So serving on the public art board um, has been really, really um, exciting for me. And uh, the one thing that I enjoy more about it is being able to expose it to more people because a lot of people just weren't aware of it. That's number one. So you get more artists involved. But also the connection to our youth, right? To get our youth involved in that because that's where my passion lies is, is, is with our young people. And uh, the just, just doing that, you know, Bob Marley has a song, right? And, and there's, a, there's a line in the lyric that says, you know, uh, music, when it hits you, you feel okay. That's what art does. Mm. And so no matter where you are, no matter what situation you find yourself in, if you get exposed to art, uh, it does make you feel better. And so serving on the public art board after I've gotten over my heart attack, uh, it's been really, really rewarding because I've been able to participate in a couple uh, initiative, the piece that we put at the uh, the Grove, mm -hmm. right? That piece was good, and and um, Pearson Farms, where we honor the the family legacy uh, with the piece there. So it's been great just to evaluate different artists, and I love when we do our art shows and we're able to talk to different artists. And I'm always asking them, you know, uh, is this your first time, right? I, I really don't want to talk to the person who's been doing it all along, right? I want to try to find the person who don't didn't you know didn't know about it, but this is their first time because our city is growing, mm -hmm. and it's it's important to grow the interest in art, and right. so absolutely. That's it. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you're part of that board now. Um, well, guys, I can't believe it, but it's already 12:55. Wow. <laughs> so we have to wrap up. We'll keep the we'll keep the live stream going, Anthony, for just a little bit because I do want to ask at least the last question, um, which I like to ask in all of our luncheons when we're in person. And um, but it is, what would your current self tell your younger self, and why? <laughs> Let it sink in. <laughs> Peter, you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> slow down. Um, I think slow down. So, you know, one of the people ask me all the time, why do you do some of the things that you do? I had um, people along the way, my entire journey, if you can go back and look at it, and there were people there that helped me to make decisions, right? So as I was rushing through doing different things, I found that there were people there that was basically holding me back and said, wait a minute, stop, think about it before you do it. Remember, I wanted to drive a tank. And a recruiter helped with the decision to go into an area that uh, fit uh, my schedule. And then I met leaders along the way who literally stopped me and, you know, and, uh, and teach me different things. So I think for me, if I was telling my younger self, slow down and, and just kind of learn and listen and pay attention to those things that are around you as you go through it, right? Mm -hmm. um, don't just drive down a road and miss that great art piece that was sitting on the side. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's, that's what I would say. That's yep. a good one. good one. Rob? Oh, were you pointing to Bryce? Do you want him to go? Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to throw Bryce in. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting to know you. Let's get a beer because I, I love your painting and I just, I'm, it's funny when we talk about veterans and art and. Me first. Yeah, yeah, but. Well, I, I know you we'll and I know. Right after yeah, this. We have wine together sometimes. Yeah, so, um, I. Uh, yeah, you know, I think I would echo what Peter said. Uh, slow down. And I would also say, you know, really get after surrounding those people. You're surrounding yourself with those people that you want to be like. Mm. Uh, instead of just as a young person running, yeah. you know, head first, full speed ahead. Uh, you know, whatever my experience was, I'm going to go figure it out. Just stop, find some mentors. I, I do very much believe in the the work hard, pull yourself up by the bootstraps sort of uh, philosophy, but I also equally believe very hard in, or believe very strongly in, Tammy, can you show me where my bootstraps are at? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, people kind of, we're very, we have some toxic narrative out there right now, and it's so silly because I, I had a mentor from the Bush School tell me that on a policy project that they realized that when they got past the noise, they both wanted the same thing. And so if I had stopped, if I had stopped along the way and said, you know, Tammy, Peter, Bryce, Sheena, where are my bootstraps at? And I, I could have gone, I could have avoided a lot of heartache as a young person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you would have said, hey, hey, slow down, private. There's your, <laughs> your boots yeah. are right there, okay? Yeah. Put them exactly. on. Exactly. So <laughs> I, I would say slow down and, and seek out successful mentors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
It's very good. Yeah. Very good. Absolutely. Echo that completely. Um, I would talk less and listen more. Mm. For sure. Um, yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I'm just like I, I can do it all on my own. I don't, you know. But what I've come to learn over the years is that. Um, yeah, I could probably do it, and I, yeah, but it wouldn't be as fun, and it wouldn't be as successful without you know the people that have their hands in you know your life as it is to to shape you and mold you to who you are. I mean, everybody from my parents to the soldiers and the leaders I had in the military to my comrades in the VFW. I mean, who would have thought I would be the VFW commander? I'm like, I have no idea, like wh- why, but. Um, it was because I listened a little bit more to see what the need was, right. and um, they were like, "Okay, you do it." So <laughs> <laughs> well, that's um, what happens when you listen, right? <laughs> well, I mean, I try. I mean, I, I really try. I'm still growing every day, um, mm-hmm. but that's what I would I would talk less. Mm. I talk it enough as it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so glad you talked today. Yeah. Uh, right. I actually a couple things I would tell myself: don't be afraid, mm. right? I mean, I, I, I climbed and went through all the tryouts to get to where I got to. And the whole time I was plagued by self-doubt. Mm-hmm. And what, do I deserve this? Am I really good enough? Mm-hmm. Is everybody going to figure out that I'm a fake? I'm faking it till I make it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter how good I got. I always thought I was faking it. So I would tell myself, don't be afraid. Mm-hmm. And then in, in that venue of run the race to win, but make sure you're running your race. Mm-hmm. Not somebody else's race, preconceived notion of what you think success looks like. Right. Just go be you. Um, and the reason why I think that's an important lesson is because I have been all over the world with different militaries, different cultures, and the one thing I found was everybody's the same. Myers-Briggs tries to break us up into a bunch of different personalities. We're all the same. Mm-hmm. Everybody's got, Maslow had it. Everybody's got the same needs. Mm-hmm. And so especially now with, while we're waiting um, to find out uh, timestamp if somebody watches this in right. a month, uh, we're still waiting to find out who's going to be the president. Mm-hmm. Um, and as rife as people are and polarized and they want to get entrenched, if I'm a unique, I'm a snowflake, I'm, a, I'm different, I'm better, I'm a victim, I'm not, we're all the same. We all want the same thing. And so if we can focus on the camaraderie, what brings us together, the unity of what makes each of us special, we served at different times in different mm-hmm. locations. Um, but you can always find one thing that brings people together. So focus on that commonality and uh, you'll find that you know, there's a lot of bleed over and not so different. You don't, and just slow down and just be a little bit more happy. So well yeah. said. Um, and yes, that timestamp is so interesting, right? <laughs> we are waiting to figure out who our next president's gonna be. Maybe it happened while we were in this <laughs> live stream, I don't know. But, um, but thank you all for joining today and for the conversation and, and exactly to your point, you know, talking about things that bring us together because we all do really want the same thing. So thank you all for joining. And um, Kalika, were there any questions that we didn't address? We're good? Okay. Um, Well, thank you for for being there and Anthony and Annette for hosting. Um, And uh, until next time, be kind to one another and keep creating. Thanks so much. We'll see you.